Thank you for auditing Professor Sky's record review, the only first listen new music review show hosted by a French professor who's about to make a very bad joke. Today, I am reviewing Perfume Genius. Do you get it? Well, I am a French professor, and at the end of this video, I won't subject you to it now, but at the end of the video, I'll explain the joke and why actually it's not as stupid as it seems. What is the connection between Proust and Perfume Genius? And I need to start my show the way I often start them, which is by professing my ignorance. I like to say my ignorance is profound, which means I have a lot of ignorance. I don't know anything about Perfume Genius, nothing. I come into this album with completely virgin ears, no concept of what I was about to hear or what it was. But in that ignorance, when it's paired with curiosity and an open mind, I believe it'll lead me to make an interesting review of this album. I haven't heard anything else he's ever done. I haven't followed him on Twitter or Snapchat or whatever. Jesus, I sound old. <laughs> do you follow people on Snapchat? I don't know. So what do I know about Perfume Genius? Before I review this new album, set my heart on fire, immediately. I know next to nothing. All that I've ever heard about him is just, you know, I overhear Perfume Genius, gay icon, gay icon, Perfume Genius. I think that's the only time I've ever heard him referred to at all is in that context. So that's basically nothing. That doesn't tell me very much at all. Um, when I, it was funny because when I first heard of Perfume Genius, uh, you know, I, I, I was talking about it with my kids and they love Parks and Recreation and they were like, oh, like Dennis Feinstein, which is this character that Jason Manzoukas plays on Parks and Rec. I'm pretty sure that that Jason Manzoukas heard the name Perfume Genius and created that character from then. So that's all I know. I know Dennis Feinstein, and I know the words gay icon. And where's that going to lead us? Well, I'm going to tell you. Um, I've been thinking about this album. I've listened to it. It's been out for only about 24 hours. But I've listened to it probably four times all the way through. It is a very rich listen. It's a very good listen. First of all, I need to give you a warning. Do not listen to this album through the speakers on your phone. Don't do it. Don't listen to it on a little tiny speaker. Don't listen to it in the car with the windows down because your air conditioning fluid ran out, like I did yesterday. You have to listen to this album either with headphones or on a good stereo. It is very rich, very deep, and you're going to miss a lot of texture if you don't give it the respect it deserves. But the thing that kept on coming back, the words that kept on coming back from the very first listen is... Something is off, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm going to title this video, Something is Off with Perfume Genius, as kind of a clickbaity way to, to get you Perfume Genius fans in here to think I'm going to be trashing him. I'm not. This is an amazing album. But I believe there is something intentionally done on this record where there's little rhythms or little notes that pop in which are clearly meant to be discordant or anti-rhythmic. And in those little, sorry, my hair's sticking up in the back. Nothing I can do about that. Sorry, I got, my wife cut my hair last week. I'm still, still some fallout. It's okay. Keep moving, Sky. Um, so, you know, in, in these little bits of off notes, I think it's intentional. Most songs end with a kind of like crumbling or lack of resolution. And I think that's part of what makes this album so great is there's something unsettling. His voice is so beautiful, but sometimes just a little bit off, or a little bit ugly. I think even the, the, the name of the album itself hints at that. Set My Heart on Fire is just a, you know, that's just a typical name of an album. Just set my heart on fire. But tagging it with the word immediately makes it feel more real, makes it feel, at least to me, unsettling. When I heard that title, Set My Heart on Fire, immediately, that sense of urgency and that sense of just bizarreness. It's just a bizarre way. And even the cover, I printed out the cover here. You can look here. You know, I, I think there's something off with this cover as well. You know, this kind of black and white sort of, he looks like he could be on a, on a Smith's 45 cover. Uh, you know, like intentionally sort of hearkening back to, to sort of, you know, uh, I don't want to say Maplethorpe, but, you know, like hearkening back to sort of like 40s and 50s imagery of uh, homoerotic photographs of men. That's sort of what that is, right? But it's not really trying to be sexy, right? It's just like, there he is. 
And, and there's something about him that's just so present and yet is a little bit off. Maybe it's his expression. It's not clear what he's trying to go for. So that's this whole album. It's just this beautiful, rich thing that's a little bit off. I'm going to sort of give a larger view of it, and then I'll go track by track as I like to do. I'm going to try to stay this way so you don't see that bit of my hair, but I just have to give up at this point. I would divide the great things in this album into three categories. Voice, production, and lyrical mastery. First of all, voice. How many perfume geniuses are there? I mean, it's pretty amazing. If you listen to this, there are so many different moods and personalities he's able to communicate. He has a great falsetto. He has a great sort of middle range. He even has a good sort of growl. Um, my family laughed this morning because they thought it sounded like Kylo Ren from Star Wars. I don't know if I quite hear that, but still, he can sort of go between like a falsetto voice to sort of a, a warbling voice to a clear voice. And that's really a, a, a real strength, um, to be able to have that much dynamic range and the emotion in your voice is special. And something where, even if you don't like the music, I think it's worth listening to just to experience that vocal performance. Second part, I'd say production. The production is excellent. Um, I almost reviewed an album last week by someone named Blake Mills. It was pretty good, but I didn't really have anything to say about it, so I didn't review it. Plus, I had to review that E-40 EP that no one cares about but me. Um, but still, it turns out that this guy released an album last week, and he produced this album as well. So uh, it's a very well-produced record. The whole thing has a lot of, I would say, like overtones of the 1950s. I think it kind of matches this, a sort of, uh, sort of like old-fashioned masculinity. I think it's part of what makes it so unsettling. I'm kind of going off the top of my head here, but I think part of what makes it so unsettling is that you have these kind of like 50s, like arpeggiated chords, you know, as opposed to da da da, having it being dun 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 right? And even some of the chord progressions sort of follow a kind of typical 50s shuffling, you know, one, four, no, what is it? One, six, four, five progression, right? Um, but at the same time, added into that are these little discordant elements, unexpected production notes, things a little bit off tune, things a little bit out of rhythm. Uh, the, the, there's, in any great album, there's a sort of most valuable player who's the most underestimated. The bass work. If you just listen to this album, listen to it once for the vocals, then listen to it for the bass work. The bass is very clean, very clear, very, very well played. And it's paired up well with a drum, it's paired up well with strings, it's paired up well with flutes, it's paired up well with voices. Whoever it is that's doing the bass work on this deserves an extra high five. So just, if you're the bass work person on this album, give yourself a high five. Uh, and also, speaking about instruments, there's just a, a plethora of instruments here. Plethora, Jesus, guy. That's a lame word. There's a lot of instruments here. So you see my daughter's harp in the back. There's lots of harp, which is quite nice. Lots of strings, flute, guitar, drums, synthesizers, sequenced synthesizers, harpsichord, but it never feels like they're just trying to throw in the kitchen sink, right? It, it feels uh, consciously well-developed and very well-produced. And then finally, lyrical mastery. Um, I, the last time I listened to this record, I brought up the amusingly named genius.com uh, website for this album. So it used to be called Rap Genius. It's a website that has lyrics and explanations. And I just read the lyrics as I was listening. And he sometimes swallows his words. Like it's not always clear what he's singing. So it really helps to read them. And it's some of, I mean, I don't think lyrics can get much better than this. These lyrics of longing, uh, you know, I mean, so he's a gay icon, okay, but that's fine. But um, great songs about love and longing don't have sexuality, I don't think. I think they're just human. Um, and I believe this album does that very well, where the feelings of longing and love, a little bit of lust, not a ton of lust, but it's more like memory and longing. Uh, they're just so well expressed. And I'm gonna give you some examples throughout the album because I can't even really tell you without giving you examples. The thing is, is he's not fancy with his words. Despite having the word perfume in his name, he's not fancy. He's very direct with his words. His words are chosen, and you don't need a thesaurus or a dictionary. 
but they're put together in such a way that is just right. And often, just a little bit unsettling. Something is off with Perfume Genius. So, I'm now gonna go through this whole album, track by track, in my pink Citroën, and I'll sort of tell you like why it works. First of all, the whole album is just, it's a whole, it's, it's a complete album, there's no filler, uh, it's not a collection of singles, it feels like a theme album. If I had to pick out a theme, I think it's about the intersection between masculinity and homosexuality, and particularly a sort of like a classical view of masculinity. I, mean, I don't mean like, you know, village people. I mean like, you know, like traditional masculine roles or um, positions and how does that intersect with homosexuality. That's a theme which is very interesting. I actually work with somebody who dedicates his entire academic life to that world masculinity and its intersection with homosexuality. So in that way, it's a very rich album. I think this album will be studied for years. Like I think uh, gender studies departments, um, masculine studies departments, were given a gift. This album is just a gift. It's so dense. So let's start off with the first track, Whole Life. It doesn't start with words, but with an inhale. And that's part of this album is it's very much just this guy Whatever this guy is, I forget his name. It's like Hadreas or something. Is it Jonathan? I don't know his first name. My ignorance is profound. Perfume genius. We'll just call him Perfumey. Perfumey there just... <gasps> and then starts. And it begins with the idea, half my whole life is done. Kind of reminds me of the beginning of Fleet Fox's second album. Just this concept of entering middle age and singing about middle age and difficulties of middle age. As a middle-aged dude myself, I relate to it quite well. Very interesting vibrato on his voice, where his voice is simultaneously very strong and very weak. I don't know how he does it. You have to listen to hear. Um, sad themes of aging, and there's three different stages to this song. Like, I'll have just some voice, and then I'll have some, like, kind of off, off kilter notes. And in particular, it's the guitar on this, on this particular song, which gets a little bit uh, aggressive and off kilter. He's almost crooning, and he does a thing a couple times on this album where he sings in a certain register and then just goes for a high note and hits it, and you're just happy. But it's not, you know, it's not Mariah Carey singing the national anthem high notes. They're, they're tasteful, they're well chosen, and basically the entire time I was listening to this album, he would do something and I'd go, oh, I didn't think he could do that, <laughs> just based on where he was just before. It's an odd beginning to an album. It's part of how you know that this is, album is basically a concept album because this doesn't like grab you and take you in and get you rocking. It's like, it sets this tone, this kind of mournful, slightly off tone. Then the next track is Describe, which is basically out of place on this whole record. I don't understand Describe. This is the low light of the album for me. Based on what I saw, I think it's the single, which it's not what I would have chosen. Um, it's funny though, because I've been doing a lot of shoegaze music um, and this sort of has that kind of tone, like lots of layers of guitar. I think even a harpsichord is in there somewhere. Just a sort of muffled voice. It's a little bit going behind and lots of layers going in and out of each other. It's a really kind of odd choice. Um, it's funny because when I, I, I dictate into my phone when I'm listening to the album, it actually said shoe gaze, G-A-Y-S, which is weird because Otherwise, it does G-A-Z-E. So I think maybe the autocorrect picked up that I used the word gay icon previously. It's a weird thing, this, this technology. It's the second time I sound super old on this video. How many Snapchat followers? Okay, next track, Without You. I think a typical album would have just started with this. It's got like a nice, just guitar and voice, straightforward, nice kind of solid drum line, and that bass. Seriously, you gotta listen to the song just for the bass. Um, it's almost a countryish style song. I think Blake Mills, if I remember what I listened to, is a little bit countryish. Um, but it's very catchy and it develops really nicely, especially after the first chorus. Every song starts somewhere and ends somewhere different, it develops, it moves along. Uh, and then we get to where the album starts to get great. First three tracks are good, fourth track is great. It's called Jason. And this falsetto comes out of nowhere. He sings the entire song in falsetto. And it's like his falsetto voice with this harpsichord and bass and then strings. 
And they're all brought in at the correct times. And it seems to be a tale about being 23 and sleeping with a guy who feels bad about sleeping with a guy. So I guess someone who says he's straight or thinks he's straight. Again, this is the sort of human aspect because I'd never lived this experience, but I feel like I connect to it so well. The way that he's singing about it, the way that the, the person who he's with, you know, starts crying and just tells him to leave. Like, I get the sense that this is a very real experience and it must be an experience lived hundreds of millions of times all over the globe, right? <laughs> Since the inception of humanity. But how many songs or how many movies or books have you read or heard or seen that talk about this idea? You know, it's not just sleeping with a straight guy. I've seen that before. But this weird relationship that's between them. And the way the song ends is the most unexpected part. He sings this one line in the most epic possible, it's like operatic, it's like the strings are building up and it's just building up into this amazing moment of saying, I stole $20 from his blue jeans, I'm pretty sure that he saw me. I, 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 okay, so I just said those words, but when you listen to it, you would think that it's the end of a Wagner uh, four hour you know, opera. It's unbelievable. And I don't quite get it. I don't quite get the meaning. I feel like I sort of get it and its relationship to this guy who took his clothes off but wouldn't. So Perfumey had his clothes taken off but the other guy kept his clothes on, right? This great kind of mixture between intimacy and sexuality and longing and want and shame and desire, all that stuff all mixed together. But then to end it with him taking $20 from his pocket, I don't know, but it feels super real. Also, they mentioned listening to The Breeders on CD. I was just listening to The Breeders two days ago, a great band. I saw The Breeders open up for Nirvana uh, in 1993, it must have been, and they were at least twice as good as Nirvana that night. Jeez, I'm really sounding old now. In my day, the Red Hot Chili Peppers were good. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, the next track, Leave. This is what I'm talking about, the many personalities inside of Perfume Genius. Because we have this Jason song, you know, and then he touched me, hoo hoo right? And then the next song is this full Kylo Ren, just like, where did the falsetto go? This guy's, he just starts singing his, the, the lyrics, the, the title of the album. Set my heart on fire immediately. It's like Elvis Presley and Kylo Ren had a baby. Kylo Presley? And, and that's who's singing. And it's really unsettling. And just these lyrics. This is what I'm talking about with the lyrics. Just listen to these lyrics and think about them for a second with me, okay? Set my heart on fire immediately. Chain me to the dream forever. So, you know, let's just, just the, the temporal markers here. Set me on fire immediately. Chain me to the dream forever, immediately, forever. Heart on fire. Chain me to the dream. Positive, negative, positive, negative, time, time. It's just a beautifully written line. I could really spend a lot more time on this than I'm going to, but I think you get my point. Um, all throughout here, there's like um, harp playing, doing that kind of nice arpeggio. And it's just nice to hear harp used so well, but then this calm singing becomes unsettling and everything falls apart at the end. It gets very dystopic to the point where you're just like, Ugh, I don't feel so good. I think it's like the, song, the title itself, Set My Heart on Fire, Aww, immediately. What? what? What do you mean by immediately? <laughs> Are you speaking metaphorically? The next track, On the Floor, is like an oddly shuffling dance track. I don't know why, it reminds me of Bonnie Raitt. There's no slide guitar on this, so I don't know why it reminds me of Bonnie Raitt. Could someone put it in the comments if that makes any sense to you, or am I just, am I just drunk from all the good pancakes I ate this morning? This is a good example of why you need headphones. The stereo effects are delightful. All throughout, just over here is my, 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 my uh, couch. I just sat in the center, and I plugged in my iPhone to my, my hi-fi, and just sat there and listened to Wukacha Wukacha, just this kind of nice song about, again, about longing. Like how long till this washes away, very kind of 50s sound again, 
kind of a box chord progression with nice resolution, great fuzz bass going on here. Uh, and then just these lyrics, uh, like, like how long do I have to wait? I think he says, till the rise and fall of his chest on me. Just really nice intimate details, just physical intimate details that are not gross or vulgar, but just so intimate that it takes, it sort of takes your breath away. She's like, whoa, that feels like something really lived. Moves on to Your Body Changes Everything, which is kind of a sexy track. I don't know if it tells you where my mind was. The lyrics are, give me your weight, I'm solid. And I heard it as, give me your whip, I'm sold. So, <laughs> so the first time I listened to the song, I heard it as kind of like a weird sort of s and thing, but what's going on in my head? Is this a confessional video? Not really, but it's kind of funny how that's, that's what I end up hearing. But still, this song is a great example of how he uses the unsettling. Because the unsettling in this song, the chorus itself, everything feels like it's about to fall apart. His voice is that, is that crackly, like weak and strong at the same time. But then the chorus is a beautiful release. It's a nice kind of uplifting chorus. Um, and the, as the ending goes along, there's like these strings that just act to punctuate the sequencer that's doing kind of a shuffling action as well underneath. And then eventually it just breaks down into him just saying, I know, I know, I know, I know, in rounds, in different tones, in different ears. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, different channels. I know, I know, I know, I know. And in this section, it's the rhythm that goes off. The drums are playing something and it's almost as though the drummer was listening to something else while they were playing. Something is a little bit off, always on this album. The next track, Moonbend. Uh, you know it's a good album because I keep saying, no, this is the best track. No, this is the best track. So maybe this is. Very, very sparse. And again, the production, he knows when to, or they know, when to make something bigger and when to make it more sparse. And this is just a bloopy keyboard and a voice. He's intentionally a little bit off harmony. And here's some more of these lyrics I'm talking about. Carving his lung, ribs fold like fabric, moon sketch the line, moon bend the knife. I don't have an explanation. I understand it, but I can't explain it. That's a sign of a good lyric. Then there's an unexpected second part, like this flute comes in and there's this sort of high voice that's echoing, it's sort of a Spanish guitar. Uh, and then the outro goes and the outro is slightly out of tune. And then we hit to what is my actual, actual, actual favorite track on the album, Just a Touch. If you could listen to any track on here, you should listen to this and I'm gonna play 14 seconds of it for you soon. It starts off with almost like timpani style drums, like drums are creating the melody with a keyboard over it. And I, I accidentally read it, I tried to stay ignorant, but on Genius.com it says that this song is about two soldiers in World War II who are leaving each other after being in an affair. So that's what I'm talking about, this theme of masculinity and sexuality, and this, the beauty of the song is the idea that they're singing a melody to each other and that they will hold that melody with them as they have to be part, and as they have to hide their love from the rest of the world. And it's just such beautiful longing. So I'm just gonna play you, I'm gonna grab my computer over here. I'm just gonna play you a little bit of this song. I want you to listen to the bass. I want you to listen to the way the voice kind of goes from a lower register to a higher register. And, and maybe, maybe you'll like it. Seriously, give that bass player a raise. That is just... Mm. So you couldn't hear it here, but I want to at least give you an idea of the way he's able to go from that one register to the next and that nice firm bass and the great, great guitar line coming in, all the production. Next track is called Nothing At All. Okay, so you know how I'm like working through this whole theory about like intersection, intersection of homosexuality and masculinity and all these different themes? This is just a Bruce Springsteen song. 
Like, it's just a, like, if you listen to it, now that I've said that, if you're a Perfume Genius fan and you hear it again, you're like, oh my God, it is. It has this kind of like pulsing drive to it. There's even a kind of quiet part where it's like, Hoo, sort of at the end, like Bono or, you know, Tom York, but just in the, in the Bruce Springsteen vein. And the, the way the chorus is, the way that it drives and builds on itself, it feels like it's a Bruce Springsteen chorus. But then the lyrics are, I've got what you need, son. I've got what you need. I've got what you need. Nothing at all. So again, it takes it apart. Like, not my love. Not everything you need. Just, I've got what you need, which is nothing at all. It's a great track. But I think that it's sort of intentionally taking on the, the sensitive stoicism of of Bruce Springsteen and inverting it and making it actually kind of nihilist. Like, I've got what you need, which is nothing at all. Uh, One More Try is another kind of 50s style arpeggiated chord song, another song of longing and things falling apart. He mentioned it seems kind of dreamy and that leads into the next track, Some Dream, which is, again, maybe the best track on the album. I don't know. You have to listen to this so carefully. There are these different notes that jump around left to right And then his falsetto comes in, and it's just gorgeous. And he sings these lines, and I'm just going to read you these lines, too. Fair use. Endlessly, lazy and dumb, I lick the day like salt from some dream, and bright-colored rings I gather the night and snuff out the gleam till no spirit shines. And then at this point in the song, there's like this, like, rumble, boom, I don't know, it's a keyboard or something, I actually don't fully remember, but I wrote in my notes, I don't have a script, I have notes, then bam, a real like drop and a change, how hard can it be, she calls out for me, but never loud enough, and then it leads into a second part, which is almost kind of country-ish, with fuzzy guitar, has like a, a, a piano with like tacks in it, so it's a little bit out of tune, like a honky-tonk piano, and then his voice just has all, the, all those different personalities all in this one song. It's just great. And then it ends with the idea, all I meant uh, to love is gone to the ground. Then it ends with the closing words, borrowed light. It's barely a song. It seems to be mostly a vehicle for these beautiful lyrics. I thought the sea would just make some pattern known and swim us safely home, but there's no secret, just an undertow. Again, this beautiful image of looking out at the light and the sea but then feeling the undertow, which is maybe like the undertow of death, which is dragging him from the beginning of the album, talking about his whole life, the sense of inevitability of death. So that's the album by Perfume Genius. Okay, so so this, there's no, there's no, there's nothing meaningful about me showing Chanel number five, except that um, for one year for Christmas, my dad gave this to all of his, uh, like all of his, uh, sons, wives, and it's just, it's like a nice gift, but anyways, my wife doesn't wear perfume, <laughs> so it's going to stay in the box, but then I, I also showed Proust, and, and the reason I want to show Proust is as a French professor, it's an interesting thing, because Proust is probably the greatest novelist that ever lived, and he is a genius, right, but he's not a genius like Mozart, you know, Mozart was writing symphonies by 12, whatever it is, and died at 26. Proust started when he was 40. He started at middle age. And what made him so great was his ability to recount his life, the banality of his desires and his dreams and all those things. And he's able to recount them in such a way that they transcended the boringness of his life because he was a boring guy who barely did anything and made something completely beautiful out of it. And of course, he was also homosexual, although he had to constantly hide it and cover it up. Like Albertine here, well, that's not her, but you know, Albertine the, the, of Albertine Disperu, his great lover, was modeled on one of his gay lovers. And I think that there is something Proustian in this, that this sort of like these themes of middle age and reminiscing, and Perfume Genius seems to be singing a lot about people who had to hide their sexuality and to get at the human truths that lie regardless of that sexuality. And then Proust is an artist who managed to write while hiding his sexuality and getting at those same truths. It's a great expression of humanity. Okay, that's why I went with Proust. If you've never read Proust, learn French. 
It's the greatest reason to learn French. It's too beautiful. Okay, well, until next time, for my kids downstairs playing Animal Crossing, for my dogs sequestered upstairs so they don't bark and ruin this video, and for Proust, there's the camera.